Kip, what's up, man? Great to see you this morning. It's always, I, I like that we do this on Mondays because it just starts my week off, right? It does. <clears throat> it certainly does. It's that convenient. <laughs> on a Monday, Mondays it's not. Mondays are horrible me. when you yeah. get back to work and you got a thousand things yeah. to do. We could talk about that though. I, I, yeah. If yeah. If, uh, if it doesn't work, let's bum it back to later no. or, or another day. No. Or let's be frank. It's just like working out. Is it ever convenient? No, it's actually not. True. So if it serves us, let's, let's stick with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was thinking about it. Um, my schedule is a little wonky this morning and I couldn't get into the gym. If I, I actually could not just based on some, some commitments and obligations I have, I just could not get into the gym this morning. And one of the questions that we get from guys a lot quite often is what do you do when you have a weird schedule and barring being on on uh, being on call, maybe your LEO, medical community, something like that, being on call, you know your schedule at least 24 hours ahead of time. It might change from week to week, but you know, usually a couple of days before. And last night I went through my entire week. I sat down in front of my computer. I went through my entire week and it's not ideal. It's not the way perfectly I would love to have it. This week is just requires some flexibility, but I went through last night and I just planned it out. I'm like, okay, well, I can't do my workout in the morning but I can do it at two o'clock this afternoon. So I penned it in for two o'clock. Tomorrow I have this, the next day I have this, the next day I have that. And it's really oh, yeah. different this week, but that doesn't keep me from planning it out because I know ahead of time what it is. So guys, if you're on a weird schedule, I understand if you're on call, that makes it a little harder, but you all get your schedule a week ahead of time. So if you can't do it at 7 a.m., get grow some adaptability. We talked about it on Friday's call, be resilient. You know, don't say, Hey, I can't do it because I can't do it at seven. Just figure out a different time to do the things that are important to you. Yeah. And I think the key there, I was even thinking about this last night. I think the key is intentionally planning. It, it's not going to work, right? Crazy schedules or schedules that are inconsistent. The planning becomes even more critical, right? I, I've been True. working on a house on the weekends and get my protein in. Could I have? I totally could have. But I had to be extra intentional and plan a little bit harder, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's the that's the difference. Is it just requires a little bit more intentionality and planning is all. Yeah, I mean, I even think about that with the diet. Since you were talking about the protein stuff, is you know a lot of times guys will fall off of their diets when they're when they're traveling. Well, uh, you know, I'm doing fast food. I'm doing this. Every fast food place, every restaurant in America has a chicken option and some sort of vegetables. <laughs> totally. You know, if you go to Texas Roadhouse, you get a steak, you get some asparagus or broccoli, and you eat half of the potato. But how about those uh, those rolls the, with the? I mean, honey they're butter? delicious, but oh. but show some <laughs> discipline. You know, if you, look no. if, if McDonald's is in your area, all right, get a get a chicken breast sandwich, take the bun off, throw the bun away, do without the condiments, eat the chicken breast, don't eat the French fries, and get a baked potato. I mean, guys. If, if you're saying that, Hey, this is the thing that's keeping me from doing what I want. We're really just making excuses. And I understand I do it too, but be like you yeah. said, be more intentional, be more deliberate, be more committed to our goals and our objectives. And we can really make anything work in this time frame. I saw a post or a meme or something, and it was talking about dieting. And it's, I can't remember exactly what it said, but it said, we, you know, we've gotten so comfortable and so complacent that we consider eating healthy food, dieting. Like we have to constrain yeah, It's, it's like this extra thing food. you have to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same thing with going to the gym. I've talked about it before. We have to go to a place where there's weights and they're perfectly symmetrically machined and balanced and it's climate controlled and the music is just right. And <laughs> we have all the little equipment I was talking with my niece yesterday and she's really big into working out. She's been doing really well. I'm proud of her. Uh, and, and she said that she was talking to the gym and she wants this specific machine to do this one thing. And I get it. I think it's cool that we have that option, but it's also kind of funny. We need this perfectly machined one thing that exercises one muscle group. It's good. It's just a funny thing that we do because we have it so easy. Yeah. Yeah. First world problems, right? Exactly. First world problems. Yeah. Exactly. I remember right. as a, as a kid on the farm, I used to work out in this old um, cabin that was on the property. 
threw my weights in there and the weights, like the plates are all metal. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they're yeah. just concrete. And uh, me and my buddy, Richard, we'd go in there like at 5 a.m. in the morning and just you'd freeze your ass off, like grabbing the bar, like your hand might stick to the bar. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so a little cold. water on there and it sticks. Yeah, but, but you're like, kind of like, oh, oh, you know, and then probably about 20 minutes in your workout, you were finally warm enough that sure. it was like, not uncomfortable, but everything was just wicked freezing cold yeah. in the middle of winter, you know. Counts now here I am like, oh, you know, this is uncomfortable. The treadmill, yeah. A little uncomfortable. My That's knees fun. hurt. I'm gonna go on the elliptical instead of go <laughs> go do the treadmill. Um yeah, uh, you know, this is why we dreaded playing in, in high school. In fact, it was really cool. I I was able to catch up with my high school football and baseball coach this weekend and I went and talked with his boys on the team and it's really cool to catch up with him. But uh, it, it got me thinking about football specifically because that was the sport I really enjoyed. He he really enjoys baseball, and I was mediocre at best at baseball, and I was slightly above average at football. Uh, and it, it's interesting because we always dreaded playing uh, Canab and uh, Milford and Delta mm. yeah. because those were the farm boys. Those guys were yeah. throwing hay bales, moving pipe all summer. Like they came to football practice jacked and ready to go in the first of the season. Yeah. Farm strength. Farm yeah. strength. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's funny. All right, man. Should we get into some questions today? Yeah, for sure. Uh, before we actually get into those questions, um, this conversation about you and I about, Hey, you gotta, you gotta get to the gym. You, you gotta go when you gotta go, you gotta plan. These are kind of the conversation, not kind of, these are the types of conversations that happen in the Iron Council when you're part of a battle team. Yeah. When you're part of a group of other men and you're having these kind of talks of, dude, no, you got to get to the gym, do this, and you want someone to help push you, right, and hold you accountable. Uh, we are open for enrollment for the remainder of this week. So if you're on the fence, you want to execute and band with some men and get held accountable going to the second quarter of this year, go to orderofman.com slash iron council. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Like you said, all right. For a couple more days. So let's get after it. Yep. Join us. All right. We're fielding questions from Facebook. If you haven't joined us there, go to facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Chad Owe, how to get back up after being betrayed by an ex-wife or a wife that is now an ex left with very little resources, small amount of time to see kids, how to get the strength to move forward and rebuild. Love what, love what you're doing. My brother, Ryan, thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's hard, obviously, you know, that's a difficult thing because you probably prided yourself on being married. You pride yourself on being a father. You probably wrapped up your identity in those things. And now it's taken away. And not only that, some of the resources to be able to be those things is diminished. So that's also yeah. very challenging. So here's what I think about it. Um, you can't control other people. And even in the post itself, I recognize a little bit of animosity and contention and resentment towards your ex, which based on the limited information we have here is understandable. But I think you have to ask yourself whether or not that contention and animosity is serving you or if it's like shackles that you've shackled around your, your ankles and your wrists and you're allowing it to hold you back. Maybe if you decided that you're not going to harbor those, those thoughts and those ideas and that contention, that animosity towards her and let that go, you could spend more of your time, energy, and attention focused on the things that are within your control, like getting your health in check, like developing new skill sets, building out a, a band of brothers. Maybe it's deeper, more meaningful connections with guys who are already in your circle, or maybe it's entirely new people. Another thing is getting yourself out there. I know that you're probably feeling down and depressed. Your situation has drastically changed. And so putting yourself out to meet new people, and I'm not even talking about women. I'm just talking about meeting new people. Maybe a buddy calls you up and says, hey, man, do you want to go to the sports event that, that we have this weekend? The answer is most definitely yes. Hey, I'm going to go to dinner tonight. Do you want to come with me? You may not feel like it, but the answer is most definitely yes. When you're at Walmart and you have the option to go through the self-checkout lane or you have the option to go to the one that has the teller, you go to the one that has the teller because you're going to help. it's going to help you interact with other people. 
There's things that are with, entirely within your control. And when we focus more of our time and attention and energy on the things within our control, then our life, I was going to say miraculously, but it isn't miraculous. Our life just changes. It gets better. So the other thing, so that's one, focus on you. Now, what can you do with her? Well, you have to build some sort of amicable relationship with her. And I know that's a tough pill to swallow. I know that she might be, to put it bluntly, a vindictive bitch. I don't know if she is, but I know that you're probably feeling like that to some degree, or you wouldn't be asking this question. And you got to let that go. You ha Even if you have to just stuff it down inside for now, because what's more important is not how you feel about her behavior. What's more important is that you build a working relationship with her so that you can be in your kids' life. That, that's the most important thing. And that might mean yeah. letting go of the ego, letting go of the pride, faking a, a grin if you have to when you see her because you hate her. I don't know. But do what you need to do. This is strategy so that you can be in your children's lives. Yeah, totally. You know, the, um, the way we get past hardship is by making that situation become the best thing that could have ever happened to you. Right. You, Chad, you want to level up in a way where you're like, man, that kicked me in the butt in a way that I'm kind of in a crazy sense, grateful for it because it catapulted me to become the man I am. And it can do that. If you choose to allow this to be a learning experience and, and a catalyst for you to become better. So that's, that's how we deal with, even regret, even when we make mistakes, that's how you deal with the mistakes is you grow from them. And then you're kind of like, well, okay, you know what? I'm almost happy that that happened because I wouldn't be who I am today. And I'm happy with who I am today. So in, in an odd sense, I'm grateful for it. And another you know, thought here, Chad, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, what's interesting about what you just said is it doesn't take some sort of external factor to to do that it doesn't take her changing her behavior for you to do that or or for you to get a promotion or for you to find another lovely woman like it takes no because look some of that stuff will happen it might happen but it's beyond your control you know what it takes it takes you deciding that's it yeah. it takes you making the decision that hey this is really bad this is really bad but it's gonna be okay and I made a post yeah. on Instagram yesterday, in fact, and I said, you know, if, if you're going through a difficult time right now, just extend your time horizon. Because I think what happens is when we're feeling really crappy about our lives, and sometimes we have, we have a reason to feel crappy about them, it's because we're stuck in the moment. Yeah. And what I would suggest is that we look at the longer term play here. What's the longer term play? And if you extend your time horizon, then what ends up happening is you start doing things that are going to serve your future self rather than wallowing in your current self pity. And it gives you hope. I, absolutely. And I think in the post yeah. that I made yesterday, I said, what is it that your future self would thank you for doing in this moment, despite your current circumstances, that's what should be leading your decision-making process. Totally. Not totally. how you feel today and right now. Yeah. And in the spirit of like focusing on what you can control and, and Chad, I, I realize you, you may be in the, in the midst. So this may seem very difficult, but I, I just want to, if you don't mind, well, if you don't mind, I'm giving you advice whether you're asking for mine or not. You can tune um, out if he doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's, here's the black belt move to deal with this. Understand her. I know that seems super crazy. But you will not be able to let go of that betrayal and hurt until you see her for who she is, not from a negative perspective, but see her as a human and understand her. And through empathy, you actually are able to let go. Now, you don't have to be agree with her and you don't have to be okay, with, but you need to understand her. And almost get to a point where you're like, oh, I, man, I, I get her. Not my, not my top cup of tea. You know, I don't have to agree with it, but I understand it and almost come to a level of like empathy Yeah, of like, because you should feel kind of sad for, and by the way, that's your children's mother. So you should care to some well, extent. If you right? care about and your so kids, like you got to care about the, her well-being. 
Yeah. And, and the more you can go, you know what? I get her and, and I almost feel sorry for her in the sense of like what she's done to our marriage and broke up, you know, things, but I get it and I understand her. And, and the more, the quicker you can get to that is the quicker you can actually let go and not have her actions just tear you apart. And yeah. trust me, I know what that feeling of tearing apart feels like. So this is speaking from experience. It wasn't until that, and I'm going to say maybe in a more extreme way, it wasn't until I was able to love and accept my ex-wife for exactly who she was. It wasn't until then that I was able truly to let go and not be affected in a negative way by the by our marriage failing. Yeah. You know, as you're saying that Kip, I hear a lot of these like modern red pill type guys that are like, no, she's this and she's that and it's her fault and women this and women that. And you know what you deciding to make those types of decisions you're talking about, Kip, isn't for her anyways. Mm -hmm. And that's where the confusion comes into play. If I treat her with respect, you're like, oh, well now you're bowing down. You're being a cuck. You're being a beta. You're being a simp. These are the words people use. No, you're not. Yeah, yeah. You're doing it for you and your kids. You're not doing it for her. Maybe you still love her and there's some love in there. And so I think it's good to treat her with some sort of respect, you know, but that's not the ultimate objective. The ultimate objective is that you're doing it for yourself to let go of the animosity and contention and hostility. And you're doing it for the relationship that you have with your children. And people that say, well, that's a simp move. That's a beta move. Those guys are angry, they're bitter, they're contentious, they're miserable, and they'll probably spend the rest of their lives alone. And if that's what you want, then sure, go that route. But I don't think that's and, what you want. And they're being controlled by the yeah. heart and the hurt forever until True. they let go. Good point. Solid point. Yeah, that's a yeah. that's a weakness move, not a not a strength move. Totally. It's a good point. Kid. Totally. All right, man. What's next? Josh, Josh Newton, how to talk to your kids about suicide. Teacher at my daughter's school took his own life in the car in the parking lot during school hours, and this middle aged school, uh, middle school aged kids. Hmm. Man, in his in his parking lot. What a I mean, what a selfish thing. You know, I don't I don't want to assume that I know what that. I mean, obviously that person's going through a difficult time, but in the parking lot of the school, now he's affecting kid. He or she is affecting children. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's bad. Um. Well, here's what I would say. You're at the stage right now, but I, I want to ask you another question. This goes for other, other guys who are going have to have difficult conversations with their kids. And you will, trust me, if you haven't already. Uh, I think all of the other conversations that you've had about some of the weirdest, most random things that are seemingly insignificant are really going to determine yeah. how this conversation goes. So what other conversations are you having with your children about their interests, about hunting or cars or dance or this particular TV show they like or the gossip, you know, my daughter shares between her and her girlfriends? How am I responding to those conversations? Am I engaged? Am I focused? Am I present? Am I listening? Am I asking questions? Or am I condemning or shutting it down, judging the way that I handle those types of conversations make these types of conversations all the more powerful. And then you won't have to ask questions like, how do I talk with my kids about this? Because you already know. So, you, so you're saying we have to listen to them all the time? All the time about stuff that oh. you just don't want to listen to. <laughs> Screw that. You know what, Josh? I'll get you another podcast to listen to. We'll, we'll get your <laughs> questions somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, man, it's hard. Like you're a full-time dad though, right? Not just a dad when you have to have a difficult conversation. So that's that's one angle I really want to make sure I address is that conversation that your daughter has about how this one girl at school is mean. It's bro, been you prepared better, for the last six months. Yeah. You better listen to that conversation. I know it sounds dumb. I know you have a thousand other things to do. I know it's it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things but it's not actually like you better listen to it and you better pass that test because this test will be easier if you do. So now, okay, that's out of the way. Now, how do you address this? You ask, 
questions. That's it. Hey, Tim, look, obviously, you know what happened at school with Mr. Johnson. And I want to ask you how you feel about that. And he's probably going to say, he or she is probably going to say, uh, I don't know, I'm okay. And, and that's not good enough. You really need to get down to it. And so you might say, oh, okay, you're okay? Yeah. Don't leave it there. Say, okay, well, how, what, are, what are the other, other kids saying about it? Oh, well, the other kids are saying this and this and this. Yeah, what do you think? Like, like have a conversation. And you don't need to, ex I don't really don't think you need to explain everything. He knows or he or she knows yeah. what happened. They know what suicide is. They, like, they know it's not right. They know it's wrong. They, they know all of that. So there's no lecture that you need to give them right now. You need to be able to ask questions and try to figure out how they feel about things. And you need to be a good question asker. So when they shut you down, and they will probably initially like, oh, I'm good, dad, thanks. Go deeper. Play it out in your mind. What kind of questions are you going to ask? Try not to ask yes or no questions. So one you can always tell is what and how questions are good open-ended questions. Like, what are you going to do today? How are you going to respond to that? Why do you feel the way that you feel? Ask those types of questions because it's going to elicit a greater response. And when they shut you off, be prepared for that and try to flank them. Try to come up with, like I said, if they say, oh, I'm good, say, yeah, you're good. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure, are the, how are the other kids doing? Oh, well, Jim's having a really hard time. Like he cried in class the other day and the teacher couldn't calm him down. Oh, really? Why? Like, this is a flank move. Yeah. Right? Why do you think he's, why do you think he's crying? What, yeah. what, do you understand what, why he's bothered by it? Do you agree with it? Mm. How do you feel about how he feels? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, this just doesn't apply to just children. This applies to your wife. This applies to your, your colleagues and your coworkers and your employees. This applies to people in your church congregation who you want to serve. We got to stop preaching <laughs> and we really have to start. And look, I'm, I'm more guilt. I, I've made a business yeah. and a career on yeah, preaching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a little different for me because people have voluntarily come here to be preached to, but in a one-on-one -on -one setting, I don't preach to my friends. Like I don't, I don't go to my friends and I'm like, Hey, what questions do you have that I can answer for you today, guys? Like here we are at the fights tonight. I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Pause the fights. Halftime. Ryan's going to answer questions. I'm going to do an yeah. AMA. I'll, hey, throw me that mic. I'm going to get up and <laughs> let me, let me spit some fire. Yeah. Yeah. No, I ask questions. Hey man, what's going on? How's things? How, how's, how's the family? How's your wife? How's your kids? Oh man. Yeah. Your wife's struggling with that. Oh, that's, that's hard. My wife did too. What, what are you doing about it? Like the, this is how you be a good friend. This is how you be influential. So ask those questions and just totally. don't preach. They already know what's going on. Totally. They know, trust me. Just, just open your, your questions to them and let them talk. Well, and the reason why, I mean, think through it, right? Why do we do this? Well, because we're, we're guiding thought process. There, there's a big difference when I come to a conclusion on my own, that I've worked it through my mind, that I've, I, I feel a certain way and I'm processing my emotions and my logic. That's so impactful. What's not that impactful is you spitting fire. I, it mm -hmm. might like motivate me, inspire me. I might get all pumped up. Retention, <laughs> it's lost. Yeah. You know, a couple hours later, I'm like, yeah, Ryan, Ryan said some awesome stuff. What was it? Uh, I, don't uh, I don't know, but it was good. Right? <laughs> but when it's, but when we create it, man, it's so much different. So much different. Yeah. And especially with kids, they're so they're so used to being preached to by you, by their teachers, by parents, by your coaches. Just ask them questions. And you know, the other beautiful thing about asking people questions, not just your children, is it takes the burden off of you. Like, I don't have to be here to rescue anybody. I don't have to be here to impart my wisdom. I don't have to be always turned on. I could just be curious about people coming from a place of, of care and, and love for those people and just ask good questions and then be curious about the answers. That's it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Peter Zeffo, my son is getting married in July. 
Any recommendations for a father-son experience before he begins his own family? Kind of fun. Yeah, that's cool. Well, awesome that that he's getting married. Uh, father-son experiences. I guess I'd turn that back on you guys and say, what do you guys bond over? You know, for me and my my oldest, and and actually my second now, we we bond over hunting. So we would we would plan an epic hunt, hunting trip. Um, yeah. maybe it's, maybe it's photography. Uh, maybe it's travel. Maybe it's working on a vehicle together. Maybe it's going to a football game. Maybe like, I don't, I don't know what you guys bond over. I don't know what your family dynamic is like, but whatever you bond over, take it to the nth degree. So if it's you guys just, you love the Broncos, like you guys just love the Broncos. Like that's been a thing. Then you go get box tickets to the Broncos game and you figure out how to meet some players and like, you just take it to the nth degree. If it's hiking, then find the highest peak in your area. And it's going to take you a month or two to, to get ready and pack up and, and get it all dialed in. And, you know, you plan it out together and you make it a, a week long trip, whatever you bond over, just take it to the nth degree. If it's hunting, I don't know, like me and my two oldest boys are going to Africa. Like some of this stuff I know might be a little prohibitive based on time and geography and and cost, but just take it to the maximum degree that you can. And I I think that's probably a a pretty good guidepost for you. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I'm all excited. Invite us, Peter. We'll come with you guys. (laughs) For sure. For sure. (laughs) All right. Jake Dillon, how do you keep motivated when it feels like everything around you is falling apart? I've been working on myself for the last few months or so, and I have come a long way, but things took a hard left and it's hard to keep going. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm most motivated when things are falling apart. Yeah. I, that's when I'm most motivated because I found myself, if things are going well, I, I tend to slip into complacency. So I'm, I'm not sure I really resonate with this question, but here's what I would do. Here's what I will tell you is that when things are falling apart, I can get overwhelmed. And when I get overwhelmed, that's when I slip into a little bit of complacency or withdraw from the problem. Yeah. So I don't know if this answers your question, but for me, what I have to do is I have to break it down. Okay. Here's this grand problem I'm dealing with and it's so large. It's so consuming. I just don't even know how to tackle this thing. And so I have to break it down into the micro. Okay, well, I need to do this and I need to do that and I need to do this and I need to do that. And so I start writing all the things that need to be done to get me back on the path or get me through this obstacle that I'm dealing with. And then I, once I have that list, I start with the easiest thing. Start with the easiest thing because not only are you going to move the needle the quickest, which needs to happen and needs to happen quickly. But also you're going to build up some motivation and momentum. Oh, man. Yeah, I did that. Okay, I feel all right. That felt pretty good. I got to win. Move the needle. What's next on that list? And go to that next point and the next point and the next point and the next point. Too often, I think we look at this grand problem that we're dealing with and it deflates us because we don't think we have what it takes to overcome what we're dealing with. Trust me, you have what it takes. Think about everything else in life that you've overcome up to this point. You've overcome some tremendous adversity, some tremendous odds, and you're on the other side of it. So you can certainly do it again. So let's do it as efficiently and effectively as possible. Break it down into manageable tasks, assignments, objectives, and start working towards those things. And the other thing I would say is extend your time horizon, like we talked about earlier, so that you can have some hope. Because right now, the walls are closing in around you. Everything's looking a little bit dark. You're dealing with unfortunate and and difficult circumstances and you don't see a way out and you need to manufacture that way out. So you need to look down the road. Like what, what does the 50 year old guy of you look like? What does this look like in five years? And you'll see like, oh, I could actually be in a completely different, I could be better. I could, I could be in a different position. Life can be better. And that's going to give you a little glimmer of hope which might help you get started on that first task that you identified. Totally. Totally agree with all of that, man. I was trying to feel, feel like uh, uh, I'm looking at my past and 
where I've struggled the most, it's always in the same, I do the same thing. It feels so overwhelming. I don't know where to start. So then I kind of withdraw and then it gets worse and versus detaching, you know what I mean? Prioritizing things and then executing. But um, there's an element where sometimes when things take a hard left, as, as Jake said, that we kind of withdraw from people as well. And so don't do that. So if things are tough, like reach out to a friend, go hang out with your buddies. Instead of going to the gym by yourself, go to the gym with someone. Don't do not do the default kind of guy thing and withdraw and go lone wolf and get narrow focused. Like keep keep your social circles going, be around uplifting individuals that are getting after it. That's also going to help uh, above and beyond, of course, what, what Ryan already said. Yeah. And I, and I, I think you're dead on with that. And again, I go back to this concept of the nth degree. So when you go to the gym, maybe it is just you going to the gym and and that's fine, you know, but don't wear your earbuds. Like, Mm. Don't put your headphones on. Don't do that. Like I I go to the gym and I see so many people with their headphones on and I get it, but I'm like, man, there's awesome people in this gym. At at any given time, there's dozens and dozens of people here who are fit who are strong. And if they aren't, they're motivated to be there and and they're here, they're disciplined. You know, some people are there in the middle of the day. I'm like, what's this person do? If they're here in the middle of the day, like, what are they doing for work? They're in a, they're in an interesting situation. Like there are so many people everywhere you go, but you got to think about it. You're shutting yourself off at so many turns because you're putting your headphones in your earbuds in and not engaging to the degree that you can. So don't, don't yeah. do that either. Yeah. That's interesting. All right, Alan Michael Atkins, how do you handle being uh, being burned by your church? I'm trying to think about, I, I look, knee-jerk reaction says, we'll just find a different church. They're a dime a dozen. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'd ask why why you got burned. How, how did you allow yourself to get burned? That's yeah. the question, I think. Not, not, oh, this guy or this pastor or this person or this, but, no, but why did you, like what, what allowed you to get burned? What did you do? Like, what were your behaviors? What yeah. were your, were you, were you naive? Were you gullible? Did you have a um, unfair expectation of other people? What is it that you did that caused you to get burned and then address that you, issue? Or did you, or, did, you or did you get burned? Well, oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. Like, did you really, or that's your perception and someone said something they didn't mean, or it came across oh, a certain point. way, like and they yeah. get clear there too, right? Like how many times we've been burned by someone and the other person has no idea <laughs> right. that they were doing any form of burning. We had a guy in the iron council and I'll spare some details, but if I remember correct, this was a little bit ago. He said that his buddy didn't show up to his father's funeral. I think is what it was. And he was very hurt by that. Because they were close friends and, and you know, I, I don't know all the details, but he was very hurt that his friend didn't show up to his father's funeral. So hurt that he just shut off the relationship. And he was on a call and he was talking about, about how hurt he was. And I said, man, probably need to tell the guy yeah. how you feel. Like, have you told him? He's like, no. I said, it sounds like he's a pretty good friend. He's like, well, he was. I said, and you shut off the relationship. Has he reached out? He's like, yeah, he doesn't know what's going on. Like, why in the world would you leave somebody in the dark like that? Like, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you not to feel hurt. I, I don't know. Maybe you should feel hurt. I'm, you can feel however you want to feel. But isn't the manly thing to do to address these circumstances and these situations? And look, you may decide I'm not going to be friends with him. But I think you owe him the decency of saying, hey, here's what's going on. Here's why I ghosted you. What? And it's still bothering you. True. True. So you when, wouldn't ask when, that when if it we leave right? a Yeah. When we leave a relationship incomplete, we're incomplete with it. Mm. The other person could not even know. And they're like, ah, whatever. And they've moved on. But meanwhile, it's like, well, you know, he never showed up. Like you're still dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, in that example anyway. Yeah. Complete things. Yeah. So I think if you've got a, I don't know your situation, obviously. So we're just guessing, but if you've got a problem with the pastor, I think you need to go talk to the pastor. Totally. If you've got a problem with, look, if it's somebody as a member of, of the congregation and that's, what's causing you to, to be upset with your church, it might be extreme, but I look, there's situations where maybe your pastor said something or did something, or you'd learned something about your pastor that doesn't sit well with you. 
uh, you know, remember that person's a human being just like you. Yeah. And, and I think just go talk to him. If you're my pastor, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, Hey, you know, um, I've been really upset. I've ha been having a hard time with the church and you, I, I learned something about you. And rather than be upset, I figured I would come talk to you about it. Or, you know, you, you, you said this thing and it really sat wrong with me and here's why. Like give the man a chance to explain himself. <laughs> and if, if you explain it and I'm like, I'm not satisfied with that. Okay. Well then maybe I got to go find a new church and that's fine. But at least I said my piece. Or maybe you say something you're like, oh man, you know, I hadn't considered how that would come across. I need to, I need to revisit that, or I need to bring that up this Sunday and, and explain that to the congregation. If you're feeling like that, other people might be. And then yeah. he corrects it because you had the balls to go up and say it. Yeah. And probably course corrected it in a way that affected other people in a more positive light because we chose to say something. Yeah. Now, look, if somebody, if, if it has to do with integrity issues, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the church is siphoning off, siphoning off funds. I, like, I don't know. We don't know enough about this situation, but if that's happening, well, number one, it's illegal. So you need to go talk with a person and actually really try to get to the root of the, the issue because there might need to be some police reporting in some of this. Like there, there, there are some issues where you need to take it the next step. But, but on the spiritual side, here's what I would say. Depending on what it is, try not to allow it to impact your faith. Yeah. Look to the Bible. I'm assuming you're Christian, yeah. but look to the Bible and ask yourself, is the Bible true? Is this really the word of God? And if it is, then you can't let a human being, a flawed human being, mess that up for you. Because that does happen and that will happen and that's bound to happen. It's inevitable that somebody you look up to in a spiritual context will fail you. They will fall short of the expectation you have of them and they'll fall short of the ideal of Christianity. A hundred percent they will. One hundred percent without fail they will. So don't allow that to muddy your faith or spoil your testimony because we're all flawed and we all mess up and totally. you might need to just be in a new environment, but don't allow it to shake your faith. Totally. I love that conversation. When I used to teach uh, young men's and young women's, that was always like a foundational lesson I latched onto. There's a big difference between the gospel, church as an organization, and then socially church. Right. And, and they're not the same thing. You know, and I used to always use the analogy, you know, you can imagine going, Hey, young men, is it okay that we wear dresses to church? Right. And they're like, no. Okay. Where's that? Show me that in the, in the Bible where that's gospel. Nowhere. Okay. So is that a church org thing or is that a social thing? They're like, no, it's a church thing. You're like, well, not in Tonga. Hmm. Good point. Oh, okay. Now it's a social thing, right? And it's like, Hey, you need to understand the differences of things, have some critical thinking, realize those aren't the same thing. To your point, make sure your testimony is not founded in people and in organizational religion, right? But in something greater. Well, I hear people that will say like, well, my, my pastor wasn't living what he taught. So he's a hypocrite. He might be actually, he probably is. So am I, so yeah. are you. <laughs> so <laughs> let me ask you this. If someone doesn't live the ideal that they preach or the ideal of expectation you have in your mind, does that spoil the message? Or does that mean they just fail to live up to it because they're a human being? It doesn't taint the message. If the message is pure, somebody not living up to it or being hypocritical about it doesn't taint the message. It just taints the messenger. And guess what? We're all tainted. Yeah. Yeah. And they are messengers, not the, they're messengers. They're not the creator of the message. Right. Right. Exactly. I think it was Peter. Yeah. I, I think it was Peter who talked about, even though he knew how he was supposed to live his life. And he knew all the things that he was supposed to do. He fell short. Couldn't he knew, we all know, yeah. we all know what we should be doing. You, you've made just like I have, I'm not pointing fingers. We have probably made it's, it's 10 o'clock AM where I'm at right now. I've probably made a dozen mistakes that go against what I believe already this morning. <laughs> totally.
And so we just got to recognize it and then move on. That's it. Yep. Stay on the path of trying yep. to become better. Yep. Jacob uh, Huckabee, he has a similar question actually, but mostly around how do we keep the faith when everything seems to be stacked against us? How do we keep faith and stay read, the horse that God intends? I read this question. Um, yeah, a lot of religious, spiritual questions. If you believe in God, then you know. What was the, what did he say? How do you keep the faith when? How do you keep the faith and stay the course God intends for us when the deck is stacked so high against us? If you believe in God and you, you believe in this divine power, then you know that the deck is not stacked against you. Yeah. And that there's a bigger game at play than you what know. you're experiencing today. You know, it's not, it's yeah. not stacked against you. If anything, it's stacked in your favor. Now, I'm not saying there's not forces at work against you. There are. But yeah. you, if you're a Christian and you believe in God, you know that the deck is not stacked against you. It's stacked in your favor. You're just interpreting challenges and struggles and difficulties as some great force out to get you. And that's not what it is. In fact, what you're dealing with right now might be something that you is the exact thing that you need that will help you fortify your deficiencies and improve and get better. Look, it sucks. I'm not saying it's going to be fun. It's not fun. It's horrible. It's miserable. It's misery. But if you believe the DAC is stacked against you, then just give up now. Because if God, this all-powerful, omnipresent force is against you, you're done. Or he's not against you, he's for you. And therefore, what you're worrying about doesn't, isn't really designed to hurt you. So reframe it. How do you keep going? Like, I, like we talked about in that previous message about uh, breaking it down into bite-sized pieces, manageable pieces. It feels overwhelming. It feels daunting. It feels like everything's stacked against you. It's not. It's all supposed to work in your favor, but break it down into bite-sized, actionable steps and start working through those things. And over the next week, the next month, the next year, the next decade, you're going to see, oh man, that was horrible. But I'm a better person because of it. Yeah. Tony Simon, tips on how to find your way and add cl clearness to your vision. So we have an exercise inside the Iron Council, the battle plan. A lot of you guys listening have heard about it. And the first step of the battle plan is to cast your vision. And I see some really poorly articulated visions from guys. <laughs> and that's okay. Because it's better Reps. than what it was when they didn't have a vision at all. <laughs> and what ends up happening when you have a vision for the first time, what ends up happening is that as you start to act on the vision that you have of yourself, things begin to materialize and things begin to crystallize. And you realize, oh man, okay. You know, I had this vision of, of how I wanted to show up as a father. I have this vision of how I want to show up as a man in general. And so like you might say, I want to be a better man. That's my vision. Not awesome, not ideal, but okay, that's a start. What does that look like to you? Oh, well, if I want to be a better man, then I got to work on communication with my wife. Good. Great. If you're communicating effectively with your wife, walk me through a scenario where you guys have a disagreement and how you would handle yourself. Well, if, and I, ideally the way I would handle it, if we had a disagreement is I would be calm and I would be cool and I would be collected. I might take a step back and come back in with a more logical approach. I might explain to her that I love her and I'm trying to do what's in the best interest of the family, but maybe I don't see all the perspectives. What's her perspective? This is what you would do. And now it's a better vision of how you would show up than just be a better husband. Yeah. But you do that by starting somewhere and then analyzing it. And that's what's so great about our battle planning process. Starts with a vision, work backwards into objectives, work backwards into tactics, 
And then at the end of that, then we look and we see, did this achieve the result, the vision that I had for myself? And it's this cycle, this perpetual cycle that we go through over and over and over and over and over and over again, every single quarter. And that after action review leads us to crystallizing our vision. So if it's on in the health realm and you decide, hey, you know, uh, my vision for myself as a man is I'm going to be 15, sub 15% body fat, and I'm going to be able to run a sub seven minute mile, and I'm going to be able to pull two times my weight on deadlift, and I'm going to do the Spartan race. Then you're going to do the tactics and the objectives, and then you're going to come back and see, did the things I did achieve that result? And if they did, is that still of interest to me? Is that still, still part of my identity? Is it still part of who I want to be? If it is, go deeper. If it isn't, pivot. Yeah. Like you think it. that helps? Totally. Totally. I mean, I think far too often we, we see visions. It's, it's, um, uh, I, you know, I want to have a bigger house, uh, you know, I want to make some money. You know what I mean? They're like almost like long-term strategies and and you alluded to it, Ryan. I, I think for me, the more that vision's around who you are being or how you show up, the better, because now it's a, it's a compass for you. It's like, okay, wait, hold on a second. The man I'm trying to become is calm and confident, but humble and is teachable and loving and caring. Check. Now I know how I should show up in this circumstance. And it kind of transcends multiple scenarios way better than be a good husband, for instance, or have a nice car or a bigger home. Yeah. Well, and the thing that we need to realize is that our objectives are not our vision. So if you say, well, I want to have a 3000 square foot home in this place and it looks like this, nothing wrong with that. It's just not vision. That's an objective. That's something that you want. A vision is who's the kind of man who could have that kind of house, right? Or, or, or have this kind of lifestyle, right? Oh, I want to be able to take vacations with my family. That's not a vision. That's an objective. I want to go to Italy with my family because we're going to have a lot of good time and fun. It's an objective. But the vision is, hey, I'm the kind of man who shows up in a powerful way. I add value to people's lives. They pay me handsomely for it. And then I use that money and I invest that in my family in different ways. That's a vision. So to your point, you said, who do I want to be? That's the vision. How it shows up might be more along the lines of an objective objectives. Andrew lasers. Actually, hold on, Kip. Can I say one more thing on them? The problem with having your vision tied into your objectives is that external circumstances, a lot of times dictate things beyond your control. So if, if, you know, the economy tanks, that's probably going to change some of your, your objectives, but it shouldn't change your vision. Your vision will still, you still want to show up in a certain way, regardless of those external circumstances. And this is powerful because, and look, I'm, I'm going through it and I, and I have gone through it and I will continue to go through it in my life. If we tie up our identity, the kind of men that we want to be in external circumstances, those things go away. They get taken from us. They deteriorate. We do things that sabotage those things. Like there's things that happen and they go away. And if our identity is wrapped up in those externalities, when those externalities go away, we're left as the shell of the men that we thought we were. But if your vision of who you are and the kind of man you are is based on not externalities, but internalities, and I actually think the word of God, because it doesn't change, then you can, you can take anything from me. And I'm not saying it won't, it, it won't be difficult. It will, but I'm still going to move forward. And this goes back to a previous question. How do you march on? We don't tie up our identity and externalities. We tie them up in internalities, things that are entirely within our control and to the point of spirituality, things that are unchanging. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good distinction. Andrew Lazars, how do you repair your relationship with your father when you are the one trying to have a relationship with him and he isn't willing? I'm trying to think of a good metaphor for this. Can't think of one, but the answer is you might not be able to. You are trying to control him. 
You're trying to manipulate him. You're trying to change him. You're trying to get him to do what you think he should do. How's that working out for you? That doesn't feel good either. <laughs> well, it's futile. It's like it doesn't work. And so now you're just banging your head against the wall, which makes you miserable. So you need to detach your actions from the results in this situation. Not always, but in this situation, you need to be a great son. You need to be a great man. You need to be a great father, a great husband, a great teacher, a great coach, a great mentor, a great value add to your community. You need to develop skills. You need to build wealth. You need to learn how to communicate effectively with people. You need to do all of that. And then you need to just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. That's it. That's all you can do. So you need to get on the phone and say, hey, dad, um, the family and I would like to invite you over for dinner this weekend. Can you come? And he might say, no, I can't make it. Say, I understand. Open invite. We'll have an extra plate at the table for you. And if you're ready, awesome. And then don't read into it. Like, don't make up a reason why he's there, why he isn't there, what, what he's thinking. No, you can't control him. And you actually don't know why he's there. Maybe he feels, look, maybe you invite him and he says no. Or maybe even worse, he says yes and then just doesn't show up. And you start con conjuring up all these stories about how he's a dick and he's an asshole and he's a loser. And, and you know what? He might be at home feeling unworthy of being at your table. Like he, might, he might be there and he's like, oh, man. I want to, like, I'm going to get emotional here, but I want to go see my son and like, I want to be with his wife and I want to see my grandkids, but I'm such an asshole. And I've treated him so poorly for a decade. I don't deserve to be there. I'm not going to go. That actually might be the story he's telling. And you're talking about how big of a dick he is. Yep. Don't make up stories about other people. Do everything that you can to be the kind of son that you want to be and detach yourself from the rest. That's all you can do. There's an element of this, you know, we talked about this early about relationships being complete. And, and you may, you may need to complete things with him and you may need to even restore your integrity with him, regardless of him changing or showing up differently for you. That's right. And I know, and I know that's super hard. But we, I mean, we've had this conversation in the Iron Council so many times, right? Because we, we get these guys that are like, well, how do I complete my relationship with my father that's passed away, right? Or how do I complete? And they all think, and we do this, I shouldn't be projecting. I do this. This is a natural tendency that, oh, okay, well, I need to talk to him and I'm going to lay it all out, all my judgments. So then that way I feel whole and complete about the relationship. Because they expect that they're going to respond in a certain way. They're going to show up differently. They're going to communicate something. And then I feel fine. And, and the lie is you don't need them to do anything other than be who they are for you to be complete. What you need to quote unquote be complete with is the area by which you've been out of integrity. I would challenge Andrea and I don't, obviously we don't know, have enough details, but I would suggest that you've probably been withholding affection and love in your relationship with your dad due to your judgment of him. You want to take the high road here? You go have a conversation with your dad and you apologize for doing that with zero expectations that he's going to do it back and zero expectations that he's going to be different. But you be you, just right back to what you're saying to Ryan. You be the best son possible. And sometimes being the best son possible is you going, hey, dad, I've been judging you unfairly for the last 10 years. When you don't show up to these things or it feels or I interpret this as, as you not wanting to, I've been totally judging you for that. And I'm sorry. And I'm your son. I love you. Would love to have you around and, and at least get complete with it. And there's huge power in that. That way he knows because- 
back to the the story of the analogy that you used earlier, Ryan, he might also be sitting in his house going, I don't want to go to lunch. Why? Because I know my son doesn't care about me. He constantly, he never shows up when I've invited him over here, or I think he's just trying to change me and I'm not worthy of his love or whatever, based upon the, the way that you've been dealing with him. So at least get complete with how you're showing up in the relationship. Yeah. Look, I, I, this is powerful because I know a lot of men are dealing with these father, father type wounds. I, look, I have been, you know, the, the only reason I tell you that is because that's what I was doing to my dad. My dad's passed away now, but that's what I was doing to him. You know how many times he called for my birthday? Very few, like very few. I can't actually, I can't even remember one. And then I would see him or I would talk to him months later. And he would say, hey, yeah, it was your birthday. I've got a present for you. You know how many times he sent that present? Zero. And I held stuff like that over him. Yeah. But why should I have done? Should he have done those things? Yeah, he should have. Absolutely. Unequivocally, he should have called me on my birthday. If he made a commitment to send a gift, he should have sent the gift. Like, absolutely. But I now realize I don't know why he did or didn't. Maybe he was broke and he didn't have the money and he didn't want to be embarrassed and tell me he didn't have the money. Or maybe that he wanted to call me, but he felt so guilty uh, about calling because he missed last year's that he just didn't want to bring that up again or, or deal with that memory. Or maybe he forgot because he was busy serving his family. Like <laughs> there's a thousand reasons, none of which are, are diabolical in nature. <laughs> like it's just life. And we just expect people to do what we want them to at all times without taking into consideration their own situation. Totally. And we add so much weight to it. That shouldn't I've be never, added to it. Same, same thing. I, I've ne My dad has never wrote me a card, gave me a birthday gift. He's never even seen me play a sports game. That was one thing I always held over my dad. Yeah. Never saw me play hoops. Not once. And for years, I was like, oh, you know, he, but here's, here's the, here's the deeper rub. What did I make that mean? That he didn't love me, mm -hmm. that he didn't care about me. That's, that's the interpretation I put on those actions. And that's how I showed up on my relationship with him. My relationship with him was based upon the pretext, based upon the perception that he didn't love me. You don't think I withheld and I was a shitty son based upon that idea. Of course I was, but it wasn't true. It didn't mean he didn't love me. It means he didn't come to the game. That's all it meant. <laughs> That's the meaning. He didn't come to the game. Oh, he should have sent a birthday card. Yeah, he should have. But what does it mean? It means he didn't send a card. <laughs> That's what it means. That's it. Yeah. I mean, he could have, again, like, I don't know the situation, but. Maybe he didn't go to the game because he was busting his ass on the farm and he couldn't make it to the game. Totally. Like, this sucks for both you and I because our fathers are gone. Yeah. But yours is not. So start showing up and then just let the chips fall where they may. And then, look, worst case scenario, you can walk through life with a guiltless conscience in this department. Totally. And there's something to be said for that too. Let me share one other story. And I think it's related, if you don't mind, really quick. So I was talking with one of my older brothers. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but like my family's kind of broken up, right? I have actually older siblings that have not seen my parents for 30 plus years. We have these major, major <laughs> just drama and rifts and all kinds of craziness. And um, I was out with one of my brothers and he goes, how, how could you love them? And my response to him was because I choose to. That's it. Why do you love your dad? Is it because he sent cards or he didn't send cards? He does. No. Actually, you should love or not love your dad because, it, because you just choose to accept him the way he is. You just choose him because you choose to. And it, it doesn't require them to be any different than they are. And there's power in coming to that realization that it doesn't require 
pretense on on his part for you to show affection and love. I think this also applies to spouses, any kind of love, <laughs> right? Maybe your maybe your spouse, maybe you're thinking about walking away. You know, maybe thinking, you're thinking about leaving. Maybe maybe you've quote unquote fallen out of love with your with your wife. Well, don't. Just don't. Like choose to love her. Choose. Maybe yeah. she's done some things wrong. Maybe there's been some animosity in the relationship. Maybe I don't know. But don't just make the decision to love and to serve her because you did at one point. So stick with it. And I think more often than not, that behavior or the way that you approach that changes people. Might take a long time, may not be as quick as you'd like, but it changes people. But you, that's a decision. Yeah that you can make. You already made the decision. Now you just have to follow through on it. Oh, I like that. It's powerful. Cool. Any more questions or is that all of them today? No, sir. We got them. I mean, Manish had a question. How do you handle feeling like you're in a rut? But we kind of covered that like three different ways. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> so really quickly, Manish, rapid fire on that. Covered. Feeling yeah. like you're in a rut. Maybe you are in a rut. So don't be in a rut. Like do something else. That's why you're in a rut. You're doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's making you miserable. So do something different. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I you don't like have it. to stay there, guys. Like you don't. You're not destined to stay there. You're not destined for whatever path you're on. You're not like, that's not, it's not a thing. <laughs> Just do something different. I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. There's something in your mind there's a thought, there's a gym down the road, there's a promotion that's available, there's a job opportunity you want to explore, there's a woman you want to ask on a date. Yes, you do. You're just asking what should you do because you're scared of doing the thing you already know you should be doing. So do that. And don't think about it. Just go do it. And then we can talk about if you're still in a rut or not. I like it. I'm glad I brought that up then. Yeah. I thought you had it covered, but man, spit more fire. Just more, just more preaching, more preaching. <laughs> the preaching podcast by That's Ryan right. Mickler. That's right. All right. All right we'll bring us we, home. Yeah. We mentioned a couple things. Um, Iron Council membership is open uh, for the remainder of this month. So you, you roughly have this week to, to execute, to, uh, join us, go to order slash iron council. And just like on Facebook, if you haven't joined us on Facebook, join us there. That's facebook.com slash group slash order of man. And of course you can connect with Mr. Mickler on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan Mickler. That's M I C H L E R on the last name, assuming Ryan's uh, kind of a pretty standard spelling there. So. I don't know. These new age names are like <laughs> R I O N. R y a n i n e. That's a. I think that's oh, more right. of a Utah thing than anything else. So let's clarify. So at Graham and Twitter at R y a n m i c h l e r. Just in yep. case. Yep. Cool. All right, guys. Hey, great questions today. There were some common themes on those questions between spirituality and getting out of ruts, and uh, that was good. Um, it's interesting when we have themes, so it makes me. Uh, think about what more we need to talk about. And and we do guys, we take what you guys are sharing with us uh, and we try to create solutions. You know, we try to create frameworks. Um, we, we implement it in the iron council. We try to introduce you with people who might be able to serve in those areas. So if I see a, a trend, which I did on this one, uh, we're, we'll, we'll work to provide solutions. All right, guys, we will be Perfect. back on Friday until then go out there, take action and become the man you are meant to be.